वहीं से होगी ना गुड आफ्टरनून सो गुड आफ्टरनून डियर डॉक्टर्स एंड एस्टीम डेलीगेट्स ए हार्ट फेल वेलकम टू द मल्टी स्पेशलिटी हेल्थ सिम्पोजियम होस्टेड बाई इटर्नल हॉस्पिटल एंड जयपुर डॉक्टर्स वेलफेयर सोसाइटी we are fortunate that you all are here today and uh, you have spare your precious time for this uh, conference and we are thrilled to have you all here today ladies and gentlemen so today we have gathered here to explore the latest advancements and big breakthrough in various surgical specialties your active participation in discussion and q and a session is encouraged and as it contribute the success of the event let's unite learn inspire to enhance patient care and healthcare practice so first i will request dr ajit bana sir chairman cardiac sciences department so first i will request for the lamp lighting sir dr ajit bana sir dr vikram sir and dr ds malik and all uh, respected members who are sitting on the front row डॉक्टर नवनीत डॉक्टर सुप्रिया आप ज्वाइन करें so thank you very much now i will request dr ajit bana sir to start the session dr ajit bana sir is the chairman cardiac sciences at eternal hospital thank you good afternoon thank you very much nitesh for introducing me and uh, somebody has specs here whose specs are this glasses so i'll be talking about the heart valves so we all know that heart valves are two types they are mechanical and bioprosthetic so i'll be talking about bioprosthetic valves mainly mechanical valves are uh, use the valves which require anticoagulation and one indian company has come up before this we used to get all these valves from international companies from medtronic from other companies and they used to charge a lot of money with us now myrel which is a indian company based in gujarat they have developed the technology which is in wapi and they have a very good lab there so they have developed these valves mechanical valve is known as minolta this was launched in 2019 and implanted in march daffodil is a bioprosthetic valve tissue valve it is a bovine pericardium 
एंड बफलो हार्ट की पेरिकार्डियम से बनता है एंड इट्स वेरी वेल ट्रीटेड दिस पेरिकार्डियम इज इंटरनेशनल स्टैंडर्ड देन फ्लो मैरो इज ए बोवाइन टिश्यू हार्ट वैल विच इज़ फॉर द माइटल पोजिशन एंड डेफोडिल न्यू इज फॉर द एयोटिक पोजिशन नेक्स्ट तो डेफोडिल स्टडी फर्स्ट ह्यूमन इम्प्लांट वॉज इन टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन एंड सिंस देन सो मेनी इम्प्लांट मोर देन फोर हंड्रेड इम्प्लांट्स हैव बिन डन इन इंडिया एंड आउटसाइड इंडिया दिस इज द वैल विच इज अप्रूव्ड बाय सी मार्क मीन्स इट इज बीन यूज इन यूरोप इन जर्मनी ऑल्सो एंड नाउ डेफोडिल फाइव ईयर स्टडी इज कम्प्लीटेड इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड द रिजल्ट आर वेरी एनकरेजिंग एंड डेफोडिल यू इज अ लेटेस्ट जनरेशन वैल विच वॉज लॉन्च इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री and first commercial implant was done in february we have also implanted in few patients next so this is a one year data one year data was equal to any of the international level valve which is uh, commercially available in america or other part of the world this indian valve has shown that they are no less than any other valve which is available across the globe and the one year data was encouraging people were thinking that myral valve will not do so well there will be some problem with this valve but the results were very encouraging the study continued for 5 years and the 5 years results were also of the same standard of any other bioprosthetic valve means tissue valve means the valve which is developed from the from buffalo heart they have the similar results exactly same as any other american or european valve so we should be very very proud of it that some indian company is doing a remarkable job for developing a valve which is as par to any other valve across the globe next so this is the publication which was published and went in across in uh, 2020 said half the cost of the valve so usually these bioprosthetic valve they cost about 4 to 4.5 lakh rupees good valve whereas the myral valve comes at about cost of 2.5 lakh rupees so it is almost half the cost with the similar results and if you ever get a chance to see their company in uh, in wapi in gujarat their r&d labs their uh, technological engineer their biomedical engineers the labs are as advanced as any other american or european valve labs next this is a small video which will show you how this valve is been created if this works is a polymer stent on which we put a frame and we cover it with a cloth so that it will not be thrombogenic
Thank you. And this uh, Myril company first launched a transcatheter valve, which is very famous across the world now in Europe. It is not launched in America, but in Europe. And we at ESCC are very proud of it. That first human implant was done at ESCC in 2018 for transcatheter heart valve. And we are also part of this study, which is going on at our center at ESCC. And this valve is phenomenally good for your patients who are requiring a bioprosthetic valve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Banasar, for nice presentation. For the next presentation, I will request Dr. Vikram Goyal, sir. Dr. Vikram is a director of cardiac surgery at Eternal Hospital, Sanganir. So we welcome Dr. Vikram Goyal, sir, for the next presentation. Thank you. Give a big round of applause for Dr. Vikram. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody respected seniors and dear colleague. I am thankful to the organizers, Dr. Mukherd and others to give me opportunity to showcase my work. I have recently joined Eternal Hospital Sanganer. And let me tell you something about the Eternal Hospital Sanganer. Eternal Hospital Sanganer is undivided multi-specialty hospital having all the ultra modern and sophisticated equipment and instrument to deal almost all type of cases, including the complex cases as well. So, and with the backing of ESCC 24 into 7, 365, this makes this hospital even more trustworthy. So today I am going to talk about some advancement in the cardiac surgery that is minimal invasive and also show some complex cases. And I know this is afternoon session, so I will be very, uh, you know, short and slow. So con as we know, the conventional cardiac surgery is done with the mid sternotomy. Sternum is split, and then after the procedure, the sternum uh, is sternum, uh, is closed by the sternal wire. So there are certain issues. So though the conventional cardiac surgery is still the gold standard surgery, there is no doubt about this, but there are certain issues with the conventional cardiac surgery, namely hospital, long hospital stay, long procedure to work time, issue with the scar, sometimes very bad scar in the sternum, hypertrophic or keloid, issue of the wires, infection, bone cutting, and cosmosis. So with this, the uh, search for the uh, procedure where these sort of issue can be taken care of, started, and with 15 to 20 year uh, search, the advent of the minimal cardiac, invasive cardiac surgery done where the incision is small and sternum is not split. And good news is that this is a well established now and almost all valvular and selected CABG and few congenital surgeries can be done. And with the experience, we found there are three important points to develop me MICS as a gold standard, that the incision has to be small. And the procedure, the operative procedure should be direct. I mean, there is no, there should not be any need of the sophisticated instrument like endoscope or robot. And of course, the sternum has to be spare. So we use three inches incision on the right or left side it, and uh, uh, depending upon the pathology. So MIC has happened because of the advancement in anesthesia, perfusion, as well as CPV, as well as surgery. So surgical advancement in terms of the instrumentation with long needle holders, forceps, self-retaining LA retractors, chitwood clamps, and coming to the individual surgery, mitral wall replacement. This is for us, we, found, we find that this is a gold standard operation and with the self-retaining retractor, okay. Back, please. Back, please. Uh, yeah. Here we can see that with LA retractor and small incision, we can see the disease mitral wall, that is a stenotic rheumatic mitral wall, uh, absolutely well. This is a uh, suture being taken in the cut mitral wall 
and this is the prosthetic prosthesis being put and we can see that how good the exposure is you can check the well and do exactly the same way like you do in the mediastinotomy next next please coming to the mitral valve with the tricuspid repair again there is no contraindication and with some sort of a surgical manipulation you can easily do the tricuspid repair this is the exposure of the tricuspid valve and the exposure is so good that you can do whatever type of tricuspid repair you want to do now coming to the aortic valve replacement uh, not all but many uh, most of the aortic valve can be done replacement can be done with minimal invasive thoracotomy and here we go uh, we uh, go with the second intercostal space one inch lateral to the right sternal edge here we can see the uh, aorta the exposed aortic wall and suture being taken and aorta is closed repaired and this is the final incision coming to the coronary artery bypass surgery that is basically a elephant in the house coronary artery bypass grafting as we all know is a time tested procedure gold standard treatment for coronary artery disease it is time tested procedure with a low morbidity and long term efficacy next please there is some glitch in this can we move it change it next next so the need of the r is that to develop a reliable time tested procedure with less morbidity should not be having any compromise on safety it should be reproducible in short a procedure with a clinical benefit of a ptca uh, clinical benefit of a cabg and morbidity of ptca so mi cabg exactly the same procedure as the gold standard except the approach no changes conduit no changes in osmotic techniques to so hopefully the same results we use 3 inch incision lateral thoracotomy left side cpb lima harvesting proximal anastomosis and distal anastomosis are the four part here we can see the lima harvesting and with this specialized retraction system and uh, specialized instrumentation we can fully harvest the lima here we can see the fully harvested uh, uh, left internal mammary artery and for proximal technique proximal uh, anastomosis the aorta should be in digital control and with the experience we have moved from one proximal in aorta to almost all proximal anastomosis on the aorta here we can see the aorta is clamped there is a one proximal anastomosis and two proximal anastomosis and here in this slide we can see three proximal anastomosis so that uh, uh, we can uh, you know graft multi vessel uh, coronary artery disease with this next please so coming to the distal which is the most important thing then the idea is and the bottom line is there should be no compromise same technique same instrument of course the long term success of this technique depend upon the zero tolerance for the bad graft quality here we can see the how good the exposure of the posterior and inferior vessels and anterior vessel as well this is the coronary vessel being opened and shunt being placed next please and this is the final result 
Now, just to conclude, these are few complex cases, the photographs which we have done recently. CABG with a peripheral vascular disease, multiple graft with aorta-elac disease, and ascending aorta bifemoral graft. As the life expectancy is increasing in this part of the world as well, we are uh, seeing more and more cases of the carotid artery surgeries these days. Redo surgery, naturally, the same again with the life expectancy. We see more and more redo surgery, and uh, the, you know, the mortality and morbidity has really, really come down to 2 or 3 percent only in redo surgery. And we have moved from open vein harvesting in a cabbage to the endoscopic vein harvesting in many cases. Composite graft CABG, Lima Rima Y, total arterial in certain cases. And we also, we are also doing some pediatric or infant cases. And here we can see that complex cyanotic tetralogy with hypoplastic pulmonary art, artery, complex cyanotic truncus arteriosis, epicardial pacemaker. And these are the smiling kids, which we have done recently. Thank you very much. You hear me? Yeah. Anyway, a very uh, excellent talk and very comprehensive cover. And being in the diagnostic side, non-invasive cardiology, uh, we are there helping you to make the diagnosis. And especially the subtle uh, heart failure, the strain rate and global uh, you know, GLS, which we are doing, helps to catch those patients who actually have uh, you know, preserved EF, but they are having. Yeah. So anyway, you want to say something? For medical clinical use. So yes. thank you very much for a uh, nice presentation, Dr. Vikram Gul, sir. I will request Dr. Piyush, Dr. Gansham Soni, Dr. Sri Devi. Dr. Mishra, you wanted to ask something? Huh. Yeah. And Dr. Jagdish, if they would like to uh, give some opinion and their comments. Yes. You should concentrate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and the chairperson or persons over here. Uh, most of us came all the way from different parts of the world and nation uh, to, uh, to participate in the VOD. And uh, at later stages, we realized that uh, there were symposia. And uh, how far uh, the science is progressing towards the excellence to save the lives. As of now, we saw the photos of kids. They have been helped a lot uh, to save their lives. Uh, the gratitude that we got from the parents, their relatives, it's, it is par excellence, and uh, only God can do that. And I'm very happy, and I'm very grateful to the doctors who are sitting over here, saving the lives of the doctors, uh, uh, saving the lives of the kids and patients, which most of the publics will not know. They just see you wearing a green apron and getting into the OT. Once we come out of the OT, people think only about the bad things, what, we, what happens there, accusing it against the doctors. So such uh, symposia are necessary to make the public realize how much efforts a doctor as a human being takes before he becomes a specialist. So I think we need to do more and more such symposia uh, addressing the audience, as well, not only the doctors, comrades, but the audience as such, so that uh, some knowledge regarding the do's and don'ts and uh, possibilities to save a life and uh, in turn, the doctor who has put all his, his or her effort to save a life. Uh, 
uh, will be at least uh, relieved of a uh, trauma at the end of the procedure and people should know what are the limitations of a doctor in that case i think we will be helped much to do the betterment for the society and very happy and uh, i'm grateful to all the speakers guest speakers over here hats off to you sir thank you thank you so much namaste thank you very much ma'am for your nice comments so uh, we are happy to share that more than 100 doctors are connected uh, through uh, through various online platforms and uh, so people uh, people are connected virtually and they are asking questions so thank you very much thank you very much dr bana sir and dr vikram for the nice presentation so uh, now let's move on to the next session i will request dr ds malik sir dr ds malik sir is a director general and laparoscopic surgery at eternal hospital so uh, i will request dr ds malik sir for the next presentation and uh, if uh, like uh, dr manish kumar dr manish kumar sena dr milan dr ramesh anand if they are if they are around so uh, we will request you to join here at uh, at stage so no problem so i will request dr ds malik sir for his next presentation sir will speak about the really seen hernias in clinical practice over to dr ds malik sir thank you good afternoon everybody first of all i must thank the organizers who have given me this opportunity to be present here to discuss about a series of rare hernias the case reports next slide please next slide i bring greetings to you all from eternal hospital jaipur where i am working hernia surgery is one of the commonest procedure performed today although the vast majority of hernias are typical on presentation they are rare types which can confuse even the most experienced surgeons they are very rare each constituting about only 1 to 2% of all hernias they are not often seen so doctors don't even think of them not many surgeons are experienced in dealing with them and the issues are that they are diagnostic problems because of rarity and the obscured anatomy the various type of rare hernias are lumbar hernia amiant hernia Spinal hernia, a traitor, the Gangot hernia, sciatic hernia, pineal hernia, etc. Lumbar hernia. Lumbar hernia is an common form of ventral abdominal wall hernias, accounting for less than 1.5 percent of all abdominal hernias, with fewer than 300 cases reported over the past 300 years. Lumbar hernia appears through defects in lumbar fascia or the posterior fascia. below 12th rib and above the lumbar crest this does not include incisional hernias because they are not the typical lumbar hernias next slide please traumatic lumbar hernia in the normal course of events after blunt abdominal trauma the brunt of injury is borne by the entire abdominal organs and the musculature is spared but however at times the shearing forces sustained during trauma may be transmitted in such a way so as to cause disruption of the abdominal musculature with subsequent herniation at the site next slide the stomatic lumbar hernia appears due to sudden application of blunt force to the abdomen and the location of defect does not correspond to the site of impact actually the site of injury at the place and hernia appears at different place next slide please they can be classified based on etiology into congenital and acquired acquired may be primary or secondary lumbar hernias next slide the primary hernias are spontaneous whereas the secondary hernias are always most of the time post traumatic but they may be post surgical lesions or other inflammatory lesions they can be classified based on anatomy into superior lumbar hernia inferior lumbar hernia and the diffuse lumbar hernias the superior lumbar hernia appears through the superior lumbar triangle that is the triangle of grenfurt and lasseft which is bounded above by the 12th ring which is formed base of the triangle and tail is bounded by posterior border maternal oblique and posteriorly by erector spine of the quadratus lumbar muscles where the inferior lumbar triangle inferior lumbar hernia appears through the inferior lumbar triangle that is the triangle of pettits is bounded posteriorly by the lateral border of latissimus dorsi and tailly by the posterior free border of external oblique muscle 
and below by the elytra crest, which is forming base of the triangle. That's the diagrammatic representation. Here it is the superior lumbar triangle, bounded above by the total trip, anteriorly by internal oblique muscle and posterior by quadrate lumborum. There it is the inferior lumbar triangle, bounded inferiorly by elytra crest, which is forming the base of the triangle, anteriorly by the external oblique and posterior by latissimus dorsi muscle. That's again the diagrammatic representation. Next slide. Based on contents of the hernial sac, it can also be classified, it's known as thoracic classification, into extra peritoneal, paraperitoneal, interperitoneal. In extra peritoneal, there is as such no peritoneal sac, only the fat part is herniating, while in paraperitoneal, the visages are passing through the defect with the peritoneum, but peritoneum is adherent to the muscles. And in intraperitoneum, there's complete peritoneal sac herniating through the defect. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, lumbar hernias constitute about 1.5% of all abdominal hernias, and in less than three cases have been reported in literature for the last five, 300 years. 20% of them are congenital, 80% acquired of them, 55% primary, 25% secondary. Amiant hernia. An amiant hernia is a rare occurrence where the vermiform appendix is found in one hernia sac. It's most commonly found intraoperatively during a right-sided inguinal hernia. Next. The appendix is pendant into the sac in the amiant hernia. They are almost always diagnosed per-operatively. Although rarely they can be diagnosed preoperatively if CCT scan abdomen has been done previously. It's named after Claudius Amiant. The incidence of Amiant hernia is around 1% of all inguinal hernias. They occur most often in male patients, and they are most commonly located on the right side due to the location of the appendix. Although in literature, left side hernia has also been reported. There are four types of hernia type 1, 2, 3, and 4, and accordingly, there is surgical management of all these. In type 1, there is normal appendix in a hernia, so hernia reduction is done and mass repair is done as usual. In type 2, there is acute appendicitis, but there is no abdominal sepsis. In this, appendicectomy is done and primary repair of hernia done is without any mass repair. In type 3, there is PS. Type 3, there is acute appendicitis in one hernia with abdominal wall or peritoneal sepsis. There the laparotomy is done for sepsis, appendicectomy is done, and primary repair is done without any mass repair. Whereas type 4, there is acute appendicitis along with some other abdominal pathologies. So it is managed as type 1 to 3 and investigated accordingly as per the pathology requirements. Next slide. Especially in hernias. They are usually located along the semilunar line in the area of especial and belt. It is named after Adrian van der Spiesel, who was the first time identified the semilunar line. Although it was first recognized by Joseph Klinkosch in 1764. Next slide, please. The hernia appears most commonly in the four to seven decades, and the male-female ratio is one is to 1.18. Next slide. Especially they are very uncommon and cause only about 0.12% of all abdominal hernias. They can be congenital or acquired. The perforating vessels may weaken the area in the speech and fascia, and a small lipoma or fat enters here, which gradually leads to hernia formation. Sometimes the speech hernia may be related to stretching of the abdominal wall caused by obesity, multiple pregnancies, or the previous surgery or the scarring. It has been described as a complication of chronic ambulatory pattern dialysis also. The speech hernia occurs due to a weakness of the speech and fascia, which is the layer between rectus muscle and the semilunar line. The absence of a posterior rectus sheath is a contributing factor at this location, therefore, mostly occurs below the arcuate line. These hernia occurs through slit-like defects in the anterior abdominal wall adjacent to the similar line, which extends from the tip of the ninth costal cartilage to the pubic spine of the lateral edge of the rectus muscle inferiorly. The spesial apnosis is the widest between 0 to 6 cm cranial to the interspinous plane, and 85-90% of the hernias occur within the spesial hernia belt. The hernial ring is a well-defined defect in the apnosis. That is the spesial hernia belt. That's the low down is the interspinal plane that is between the two anterospinal spines, and six centimeters cranial two is the area where the spesial hernia belt. Eight to ninety percent spesial hernia there is in this belt only. Next slide. The symptoms can vary from abdominal pain, lump in the anterior abdominal wall, or patient may have history of incarceration or with, without intestinal obstruction. 
Pain varies in type, severity, location, and depends upon contents of the hernia. Pain often can be provoked or aggravated by manuals that increases the intraabdominal pressure and is relieved by the rest. Next slide. If patient has a palpable lump along the speech and hypnosis, the diagnosis is apparent. So the same applies to the hernia appears when the patient is upright and disappears spontaneously lying down. Next slide. Clinical diagnosis is complicated by that the defect continues to expand laterally and caudally between the two oblique muscles. Some patients present, next please. Some patients present with abdominal pain, but there is no lump. For these patients, radiological investigations are requested for diagnosis. And if in, on radiology, the investigations, the diagnosis is not clear, diagnostic laparoscopy may be performed. Spinal hernia has been repaired by both conventional and laparoscopic methods. Now the case reports. The first case, a 69-year-old female patient present with gradually increasing painless reducible swelling in left lumbar region for the last five months. She fell from the first floor of his house. She sustained vertebral injuries and hematoma abdominal wall left side. She was managed conservatively for these injuries. And in the post-recovery period, she noticed a swelling which is gradually increasing left lumbar region. They were diagnosed as traumatic lumbar hernia and she underwent freedom octomesh repair. Next slide. That is the patient lateral position incision we given. Next. This is the hernia sac being dissected. Next. That was the octomesh which was applied. Next. This is putting the mash on the sac. Next. And repaired. Second case was 57 old female patient. She presented with use gradually increasing reducible swelling the left lumbar region for the last 2.5 years. She met an accident in 2011, bony injuries in pelvis. She was managed conservatively. Again, in post recovery period, she noticed the swelling. She was diagnosed as traumatic lumbar hernia, and she also underwent freedom octomesh repair. Next slide. That is the patient with left lumbar hernia. That's the CT scan showing the left lumbar hernia. There's the sac been dissected. Sac after reducing the sac. Next. This is after putting the mash, and the hernia sac was repaired. Hernia was repaired. Now next is 72 year old male patient. He presented with reducible swelling right inguinal region. Diagnosed at right inguinal hernia. He was taken for surgery in the case of right inguinal hernia. But when sac was opened, appendix was found to be present into the sac. So the diagnosis was made as amiant hernia. The appendix was very mild infield, almost normal. It was attempted to reduce but could not due to adherent mesial appendix with the sac wall. So appendix to be done and sac closed. Since there was no gross contamination, wound was thoroughly irrigated. Pre-peritoneal space created and freedom pillow food mesh was repaired. That is the appendix presented into the sac. Appendix with dissected. That is the pillow full mesh which was deployed. And this is the after deploying the pillow full mesh. Next. The next is a female patient, 48 year, presented with pain, swelling, right side, lower down for the last two months. She had a vertical scar in midline and sublimbical region. So at first look, it was thought to be in seasonal hernia, but on examination, the defect was located two inches right of midline in semilunar line, so diagnosis was made as seasonal hernia, and the CT scan abdomen confirmed the diagnosis. Next. That was during the dissection. Next. This was after putting a mesh, octomesh. This is the mesh. Next. So next case was a 48-year-old lady presented with complaints of pain and abdomen left lower quadrant for the last six to eight months. She was a known case of hypertension and she had undergone total abdominal distraction in July 16. Thank you so much. I can only say she, uh, lots to learn and uh, lots of things are improving as, and you know, everything and is improving. CCT I think even tents and stents in yes, everything right. in designing. Next. That was the CT showing hernia. Next. This was the hernial sac during this section. Next. Uh, this is after putting a mash. Next. After putting a match, next. So last case was a 58-year-old gentleman presented with pain and swelling in super umbilical region or swelling left leg fossa region. He's a known case of diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroidism. His CC abdomen showed super umbilical and spesial hernia. That is dual hernia. Next. That was the CT showing the umbilical hernia. Next. This is showing the later ventral hernia. Next. This was managed laparoscopically, so momentum is going into the umbilical hernia sac. Next, IPOM was done after reducing the contents. Next, this is the spesial and hernia where momentum is going into the hernial sac. This is the inside picture of the hernial sac after reducing the momentum. And again, IPOM was done. Next. So, 
or his case of operator and the spinal or general anesthesia, the post op recovery was uneventful. Last slide, please. Previous slide. And the follow up was done weekly for one month and monthly for a year. Next slide. So, to conclude, surgeon must be aware of all rare hernias and the methods of repair, both conventional and laparoscopic. CT is 98% sensitive for diagnosis. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much for a nice presentation. Dr. Bana is around. Uh, we have received online question for Dr. Bana and Dr. Uh, Vikram, sir, as well. So uh, let me ask uh, one question for Dr. Vikram, sir, sir, we have received online. When dealing with complex cardiac cases, what are some of the innovative technology technologies and surgical strategies that have emerged and how they have contributed to improved success rate and patient safety. So this question is for you, sir. And we have received uh, two questions for Dr. Malik as well. So first, uh, like, uh, uh, if we can ask this question to Dr. Vikram, sir. So again, I'm repeating, when dealing with complex cardiac cases, what are some of the innovative technologies and surgical strategies that that have emerged and how they contribute to improving success as, success rate and patient safety. Thank you. I think this is a very valid question. And uh, as the time is time passes on, the more and more complex complex and complicated cases we deal in our practice. So with the complex and complicated cases there is a progress in all department of the technology as well. Like I mentioned in one of my slides, there is a uh, you know development in anesthesia, perfusion, and surgical instrument as well. So, like in complex cases, we try to use the minimum um, uh, the use of the CPB as minimum as possible. Like we have shifted almost more than 90% to the beating heart surgery, means avoiding the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit, which itself is like a source of the complement activation and a lot of inflammation. So this is the one way. In congenital surgeries and in a valvular heart surgery with the advent of the radiology in a big way, we know lot many things beforehand and in depth before actually going for the actual procedure. So these things has helped a lot. And then the with the minimal invasive cardiac surgeries and the other way of doing this thing like femoral-femoral cannulation and all that, we sometimes we really, really avoid the complication of this type of a complex surgeries. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for the detailed answer. And we have received one question for Dr. Malik, sir. So the question is, considering the challenges in diagnosis, considering the challenges in diagnosing, diagnosing these less common hernias, what are some diagnostic tools and amazing techniques that can add in acute identification? How do they complement the clinical examination? <clears throat> Well, the clinical diagnosis is the one of the best diagnoses in hernia cases. But in rare hernias, sometimes there is no lump, only pain abdomen is there. Then, of course, hydrological investigations are being done. CT, CT scan is one of the best investigations that can diagnose, even sonography can diagnose. But most of the time, sonography does not give any perfect answer. So CT scan has to be done. Then sometimes even CT is not the final answer. And in such cases, diagnostic laparoscopy can be done. Who can diagnose the perfectly the hernia cases? Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, sir. Now we will request for the next presentation of Dr. Jeevan Kakaria, sir. Dr. Jeevan Kakaria will talk about the advances in laparoscopic surgeries. Dr. Jeevan Kakariya sir is a senior professor at SMS Medical College, Jaipur. So request, may I request Dr. Jeevan Kakariya sir 
for the next presentation. Good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, I'm highly thankful to uh, ESCC team to give me the opportunity. I'm just briefing about the uh, minimal access surgery. So next, please. Uh, next, please. So minimal access surgery is the marriage of the modern technology and surgical innovations. This is a uh, quote by some unknown person. Next, please. Uh, the as you all aware about history of laparoscopy is uh, start with the 1901 and when the Germany uh, people George uh, started and use a cystoscope in the abdomen of a dog that is known as celioscopy next after that uh, the journey in 1911 the first laparoscopy in Johns Hopkins and that was a 12 mm proctoscope into the epigastric incisions and uh, that was called as a organoscopy Next, please. After that journey continues in 1920, 1938, 1966, and 1974, finally, the start with the laparoscopic surgery. Next, please. And in 1985, the most common procedure, that is the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, started by Dr. Muhe. Next, please. And finally, in uh, 1992, uh, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy established as a gold standard uh, surgery. Next, please. So, see the huge difference that uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy versus the open cholecystectomy. There was a large incisions initially, and but uh, later on, the is converted into the smaller incisions. We are doing laparoscopy in hernia surgery. All type of hernias or procedures are done by laparoscopically like TAPP, TEP, and all type of hernias are now uh, started with the laparoscopic surgery. Next, please. So see the huge difference between the laparoscopy and open surgeries. In larger hernias, more than 25 centimeter incision, but in the laparoscopic surgery, only the small incisions are there. Same like in inguinal hernias, only the three dots visible. Otherwise, in the previous sites, there is a huge scar was there. Next, please. We are dealing with the laparoscopy in colorectal surgeries, all type of surgeries like benign and malignancy. Next, please. We are dealing with the hydratis surgery, either in the uh, liver or the uh, thorax. Uh, we are all dealing with the laparoscopic route. Next, please. The adrenal surgery also included in laparoscopic surgery. In the previous era, it was a very difficult surgery, but nowadays uh, with the gold standard is laparoscopic adenectomy. Next, please. Same like splenectomy in the cases of ITP and the hereditary spirocytosis, hemolytic anemias, RSLEs, Hodgkin's lymphoma, we are dealing with laparoscopic surgery. Next, please. Same like Heller's cardiotomy for ecclesia cardia. Next, please. Hytosania as well as uh, Nissen fund of lication, we are dealing with laparoscopically. Next. And the bariatric surgery. Now, the latest advancement is bariatric surgeries. That is the major public health problems. The, there are four types of uh, uh, recent type bariatric surgeries, but I am dealing mostly the MZB, that is mini gastric bypass. Next, please. So these are the results, some results. Can you see the results of obese persons, 130 kg is converted into the 74 kg. These are more results of my surgery. At least I have done 250 cases. Next, please. Nowadays, uh, liver surgeries and pancreatic surgery also included in the laparoscopic surgeries. Next, please. The liver surgery for, for, first performed in 1994 by Husserl et al. As nowadays, it's a safe procedure. Next, please. Again, the pancreas surgery is a challenging for laparoscopy, but uh, some people are doing especially the laparoscopic route. Next, please. And some urologic procedures also included like undescended testes, varicocelectomy, retrovenal fibrosis, etc. Next, please. Now we are going to uh, video assisted thoracoscopic also. So the, see the results of uh, large incisions and the, the, for the conventional thoracotomy. 
and give the only the port side incisions there is a very small incisions we are uh, planning for the carcinoma esophagus lung biopsy lymph node biopsy as well as the hereditary cyst of lung next please so now we have concept clear that even the next surgeries are minimal invasive next surgery next so see that there are two routes endoscopic and minimal invasive endoscopy is through the central lateral through the axilla pores are placed through the axilla and reach up to the thyroid, uh, thyroid level and the thyroid as well as the parathyroid surgery is by laparoscopic route next please next please see the results of cosmetic results the open surgery scars very long scars uh, ugly and but the in the era of uh, endoscopic scars see the scars next please so the emerging technology now we are going for sills nodes trocarless and endo barrier next please single incision laparoscopic surgery next so these are the single incision port where the uh, only a single port is used through the four instruments going entering into the sites so all the surgeries now we are planning for the single instrument single incisions at the level of oblicus next please so making a single hole through that all the ports all the instruments through the three ports from the single incision entering into the abdominal cavity next please see the but it is the problem is the ergonomic difficulty because a single hole at the moment of ergonomics of instrument was difficult next and the port side hernia was very challenging in these cases because of a small incisions but the, sometimes the hernia may develop post operatively next please now the procedures are coming nodes where there is no incisions similarly like endoscope this is endoscopes through the instruments are going on next please next so there are no surface incisions reduce surgical site infection reduce visible scarring reduce in pain analgesia quicker recovery time etc next please so see there is a conventional era and there is a large incisions then laparoscopic era now the endoscopic there is no incision we have done almost two cases of transvaginal cholecystectomy that is again by the through the vagina route and the procedure is done by the cholecystectomy next please that is the transgastric route next please now people are doing appendectomy by without any scar through the colon they enter into the appendix site and remove the appendix next please obesity is again some people are doing as a nodes next please see the uh, endoscope enter into the stomach making a hole and pick up the loop of jejunum and same as a bariatric procedure that is the ru and y gastric jejunostomy that is same some people are doing as a dots next please some endo barrier techniques are there next see there is a physical barrier between the ingested food and the intestinal wall so the absorptions become less so same like a bariatric procedure is the endo barrier procedure next please so benefits include endo barrier weight loss and glycemic control in type 2 diabetes safe alternative to gastric bypass because we can avoid the major surgery now the next era is robotic surgeries next please what robotics aim to improve the laparoscopy is because surgeons operate from a 2d image but in robot there is a 3d image and in the laparoscopy straight rigid instruments instrument tips control at a distance level reduce dexterity precision and control anesthetic camera control by assistant because we require assistant only dependent on assistant for surgical support through the accessory port and greater surgeon fatigue that's why robot came into the market next please so two types of robots da vinci is properly used next please so this is the da vinci system so this is precise movements of instruments in the cell unit using the console controls next please there is a important feature is a endo wrist so is a like a hand endo means is to be tip smooth the human wrist same as a human wrist so the learning curve is lesser next please but the disadvantage is again it is expensive but uh, in the market us uk everybody is doing robotic surgery next please 
नेक्स्ट प्लीज सो वी आर वी हैव डन ऑलमोस्ट ट्वेंटी केसेस बिकॉज इन अवर एस एम एस सेंटर रिसेंटली अलॉटेड टू द रोबोट वो सो वी हैव डन ट्वेंटी केसेज बट द फार बटर रिजल्ट नेक्स्ट प्लीज नेक्स्ट प्लीज so at in o to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions this is quoted by some persons we have done total number of uh, 90% cases of lab cholecystectomy i have done 15440 cases only one cases that i have to convert otherwise there is no conversion rate zero conversion rate with zero cvd injury we have done lot of procedure lab coli with cvd exploration lab colidocal cyst remnant cystic duct stone post cvd injury next please next please lab appendix diagnostic lab ovarian cs tlh uterine prolapse next please epigastric hernia hiatal hernia incisal hernia tp ta pp next please rectopexy apr ar for malignancies hemicolectomy sleeve gastrectomy gastric bypass including mcv 184 cases next please so lab gz lab cystogastomy is so total 21475 cases i have recorded all the videos i have next please so some awards next please this is my first uh, uh, longest gallbladder removed that is 25.8 cm that is published in first guinness book of world record next please that was the another second record that is the youngest person i have to operate the gallbladder next please this is own broken record that is 30 cm removal of the gallbladder next please and this is recently i have broken the record uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy with cvd exploration in the youngest person that is 217 year or old only next this is the oldest person i operated 109 year old that is published in limca book of record next please and the maximum number of stones i have operated 11816 stones in a single gallbladder next please and uh, i have also operated a smallest gallbladder that is 9 mm next please and i have published a score that is internationally published 10 point scoring system that is for sap lab cholecystectomy thank you thank you very much dr jeevan sir for nice presentation so next i will request dr yashpal singh rathod sir dr yashpal singh rathod sir will talk about the minimally invasive spine surgery dr yashpal singh rathod sir is a senior consultant at neuro surgery department at titanal hospital jaipur so may i request गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी टुडे आई विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट द मिनिमल इन्वेजिव स्पाइन सर्जरी एंड ब्रीफ अबाउट द एम आई एस टेलीफ सर्जरी नाउ इट इज एवरी सर्जरी इज बींग डन मिनिमल इन्वेजिव एंड स्पाइन सर्जरी इज इज कॉमनली बींग डन बाई यूजिंग मिनिमल इन्वेजिव टेक्निक्स नेक्स्ट लाइफ next the dimensions of back pain more than 540 million people across the world annually suffer from the low back pain and it's the fourth most common cause of disability however more than 90% case can be resolved non surgically 10% patient requires surgery and these uh, most of the surgeries can be done minimally invasive next it's an breakthrough innovation and potential advantages are smaller incision and scar minimal soft tissue destruction and scarring less blood loss shorter hospital stay less post operative pain and lesser requirement of post operative medicine and faster return to work and daily activities next type of minimal invasive surgeries we can use tubular retractor microscope endoscope percutaneous pedicle screw insertion can be done deformity correction can also be done uh, using minimal invasive surgeries 
and kyphoplasty and stentoplasty are being done for the osteoporotic fractures. Various indications are degenerative uh, disc disease, herniated disc, lumbar spinal stenosis, spinal deformities, spinal infection, spondylolisthesis, compression fractures, and spinal tumors. Next, how it works. Spinal nerves, vertebra, and disc are located deep inside the body, and that require the specialized uh, retractors through which we can uh, get inside the spinal canal and decompress it using the various uh, specialized retractors. Next. One of those is the tubular retractor. It can be placed uh, using a C arm with correct anatomical uh, orientation and disc can be removed with a small incision of uh, almost eight to 10 millimeters only. Next, in microscopic surgery for disc, uh, one to one and a half inch incision is being given. Microscope is used and the herniated disc is removed to relieve the pressure on the nerve. Patient can be discharged on the same day or the next morning. Next. In endoscopic surgery, incision is much smaller than the microscopic, almost 8 to 10 millimeters. Patient can be rehabilitated same, same day, and it can be done also under local anesthesia. Next. For the fractures, kyphoplasty and stentoplasty can be done under local anesthesia, and patient can be sent home same, same day. Next. Manish, video play. Karte. Last. I will be showing a, a small video of the MIS tail lift surgery. The facet has been exposed to, after applying the tubular retractor. You can see the parts. Now the facet has been removed and we have directly landed on the disc, removing the annulus and the disc has been removed. Lateral recess and be decompressed. Disc completely removed. End plates prepared and it's been packed with a small cancelized bone grafts. Thereafter, we will go uh, put the spacer inside it. It's being done with the only two uh, 20 millimeter of the tube. These are the cancellous bone grafts being packed in the uh, interdiscal space. This is the case we are putting uh, in the interdiscal space. It's been packed with the auto autologous bone graft. Now the particle screw has been uh, put using the C arm, minimally invasively. Now the contralateral decompression is being done, and ligamentum phloem is uh, removed. Complete decompression of the spinal can uh, canal and the foramen being done using only around 20 millimeter of the incision. After that, particle screw has been done uh, when placed and rod is placed. Lestasis reduced patient discharge on the next morning. These are the particle screw and the cage is placed. AP film. Incision only around three centimeter on the one side and two, one and a half centimeter incision on the, on the other side. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Yashpal Singh Dathod, sir. May I request uh, for the next presentation to Dr. N.C. Punya, sir. Sir, we'll talk about the surgical treatment of some neurological disorder. Thank you. Dr. N.C. Punya, sir. So we have received information that Dr. N.C. Punya sir is not around. So we'll request for the next sessions. May I request Dr. Aditya Soral sir. Sir, uh, Dr. Aditya Soral is a senior consultant at Eternal Hospital, Jaipur. And sir, we'll talk about the sports injury tips for practicing doctors. Requesting 
Dr. Aditya Sorel for the next presentation. Thank you. Hi, that's a wrong presentation. Can I have the other one? So it's uh, the folders EHCC So may I take one question for uh, Dr. Rathod, sir? So what are the key benefits? What are the key benefits and advantages of minimal, minimally invasive spine surgery over traditional open spine surgery? And how does this approach contribute to faster recovery and reduce post-operative complication? First of all, we use the small incision and the collateral damage is uh, very small in comparison to open, uh, open surgery. And because of that, patient can be rehabilitated very fast and can be discharged on the same day or either on the next morning. Okay, hi. Uh, a very good afternoon. I'm Aditya. I'm the orthopedic consultant at Eternal, and thank you so much for having me here. So without taking much time, I'm going to talk uh, something about managing sports injuries and because this is a session for uh, practicing general practice doctors, so I thought I'll keep it as uh, as uh, gen general as possible and not specific to orthopedics per se. So, uh, what are the types of uh, sports injury we talk about? We talk about you can classify sports injuries as acute injuries which happen on the field or in the area where the, where the athlete is. It may be on the field, just off the field, or it may be a chronic injury which the athlete suffer suffers because of repeated trauma, which is something which you see in the outpatient department as an orthopedic specialist or as a physiotherapist. You can also uh, classify sports injuries not only as local musculoskeletal injuries, but they can be systemic injuries like heat exhaustion. Um, can, I, can I click the slide? Yeah, so you may have systemic injuries like dehydration or electrolyte imbalances, heat exhaustion or heat stroke, which are very common, especially our part of the country, especially with endurance athletes um, during you know, your Septembers and Octobers where the heat is still on. And you have half marathons and marathons and you end up with many people having dehydrations with heat exhaustion etc and you may also have local um, local trauma related injuries in the sports like neurological blunt trauma abdomens facial fractures very common in certain sports and um, and our good old musculoskeletal injuries now we talk about how to treat uh, a sports injury i think it is imperative for us to first discuss how to prevent those injuries uh, for more of most of them, they are easily preventable, and for systemic injuries which are like dehydration or or electrolyte imbalances, there's nothing better than just giving that um, you know piece of a small piece of information to people who come to your outpatient and you being physicians. All you have to tell them is that if they are doing an exercise which involves a lot of sweat, um, our part of the country which involves a lot of heat, also especially humid heat in this area. At this, at this time of the year, all they have to do is they have to start with hydrating themselves before they start the event. So it's about 400 to 600 ml of fluid, one to two hours before they start the event. It can be plain simple water, something with electrolytes is even better. And when they are doing an event, something in the range of 150 to 200 milliliters every 15 to 20 minutes is the recommended dose for a fluid replenishment. Um, but at the same time, we see a lot of endurance athletes per se who would visit the, the first state medical area during the endurance event where they end up with hyponatremia because they had been replenishing it only with water. So any athlete who is practicing in an event which is more than 90, mil 90 minutes in duration, we recommend that they take a salt capsule every 45 minutes, especially 
there are certain individuals who sweat a lot more than 1000 more than 1 liter an hour and if that is the rate of sweat then uh, it it is absolutely essential for them to replenish the salt content and therefore sport electrolyte drinks or something as good as homemade shikanji is fine enough or coconut water is good enough for replenishment rather than having plain simple water while the athlete is doing the event or soon after the event uh the other thing is for heat stroke i think it's pretty common sense for asking your athlete not to do an activity if it is avoidable um there are many events across the globe which have been cancelled especially in europe this year which because of the prevalent heat wave um currently so yes you can ask your athlete to avoid the activity they have to acclimatize themselves the best way to do to acclimatize to a hot environment or a warm environment is to do low heart rate training um you based on your heart rate monitor there there are multiple devices which can calculate your zone 2 heart rate there were various formulas available online and all you have to do is make sure can you go back a little i'm not that fast i'm sorry yeah so the aim is to have a low heart rate training a zone 2 training also there's something called as rate of perceived uh, exertion rpe with uh, 1 to 3 being uh, easy activity 4 to 6 being moderate activity and 7 to 10 being strenuous activity this is purely a subjective criteria which the athlete athlete decides um, himself or herself and you have to tell the athlete to try and restrict their rate of perceived exertion to less than 7 well we can go ahead now thank you now for local injuries well again bit of a common sense if you're playing cricket you rather not do it without pads and helmet uh there has they have been uh, fatal injuries in the field of cricket we know mr lamba who died because of a um uh, injury to his head because of the cock because of the leather ball so needless to say you have to wear the sport specific um gear footwear being the most commonly ignored is something which is absolutely essential so even if you're a golfer and you're not wearing the golf spikes you will end up injuring your ankle or your knee at some point of time so it's absolutely important for you to spend that money ask your athletes to spend athletes to spend that money and get the uh, protective equipment they require um adequate warm up so there's just one question i have for people in the audience so i can keep you awake after lunch uh can anybody tell me what is a warm up when we say up warm up kare what exactly do we mean what what do we ask the athlete for can we have a mic for man please hi yeah That's why you may you may I'll repeat what you say. Warming up is preparing, doing the same job which you are supposed to do. It uh, to quote an example, you start a vehicle. All of a sudden, you go directly go to forty kilometers or sixty kilometers. The same procedure you are doing with the gear and accelerate and brake and all. In a slow manner, you start up mm -hmm. and you tone up your body. Uh, for some time and then you warm up and then you go to the final aspects of whatever you are doing. in a strenuous manner okay so in so what part of the human system are we warming up what what exactly is what you're warming up the muscles uh contrary to what that's yes. the most commonly held belief but it's not the muscles the, it's basically uh, let me correct let me yeah. correct the tendons which hold the um, bones tendons and uh, no so the whole idea no, is to warm up I'm your i'm concentrating my yes right so your analogy is actually correct but uh, i just like to make a fine adjustment to it and you are right so basically what you're warming up is the cardio respiratory system you don't warm up the muscles you warm up the cardio respiratory system and uh, for every athlete irrespective of the game because you're not warming up a specific system you're warming up the cardio respiratory system you have to tell them to do at least a 12 minute walk or a light jog that is what is a warm up so besides that obviously if they can do stretches good enough even without stretches they'll still uh, you know prevent injuries but with, without an adequate warm up you end up damaging yourself significantly because your muscles are simply not there they don't have the required blood flow and your heart reserve is not um, you know ready for you to take on that challenge so your warm up is a minimum 12 minute walk or a light jog that's what you're looking for in a warm up all right next please we have to do sport specific conditioning i mean obviously there's no you can't have a rugby player going and doing a marathon and you can't have a marathon and go and play rugby so it has to be sport specific conditioning which over a long period of time helps in preventing local injuries uh post play important 
most of us even if you go to the gym or if you are running or cycling or swimming or whatever uh, sport we play we tend to avoid eating within the first 20 to 30 minutes and that's an absolute sacrilege you have to eat you really get you need that nutrition in the first 20 to 30 minutes especially a, a dense protein rich diet so that your your body gets enough raw material to start repairing the muscle whenever you're doing any kind of a physical activity you are injuring muscle on a real time basis and therefore post play nutrition is important cool down is important which is again walk walk is also known as dynamic stretching and that helps in you know dissipating that lactic acid um, the collection accumulation in your muscles and that helps in healing especially it also prevents in developing post activity soreness also uh, recovery plays a very important part so if you've had an intense exercise your athletes had an intense exercise ask them do not to compromise on the recovery and sleep and therefore rest days in their regimen is an important part uh, you see many athletes on your televisions and playing especially the ones who are very famous have all kinds of multicolored tapes everywhere they can see i've seen a lot of marathoners having tapes on their calves on their ankles on their i mean god knows wherever um the use is controversial there's absolutely no scientific study which supports unequivocally the use of either braces to prevent ligament injuries or joint injuries as well as taping taping is something which we would ask the athlete to use for a very short period of time when they are in the season they have injured themselves and they are a vital player of that game and the team cannot have that athlete sit out on the bench so we can give them taping um uh, that's only a stop gap arrangement if you are using taping or one of your athletes come back, comes back and you know is asking for tape or hair and there then just ask them to you know it's it's better to discourage them for, from doing that next please well so this brings us to management we are talking about prevention but management of acute injuries on the field of play the basic idea is to get them out from the field of play as quickly as possible you would want to stop the game um you will follow the acls protocol especially if the head and neck injuries or traumas where we know that there have been fatal fatalities on the field area itself uh, the philosophy is scoop and shoot you have scoop uh, stretchers you just scoop the patient and shoot out of the field of play there is absolutely no reason for you to be heroic on the field of play also once they're out you stabilize whatever is required for them to be transported to the hospital again no point in keeping the patient there and trying to be heroic there are people at the hospital will be more than happy to take that burden on your behalf um talking only about msk injuries because i'm not trained enough for the others uh, the there are phases of care there's an acute care which can happen soon outside the field area or when they reach the hospital then there's pain control and diagnosis which is again vital the third step is either surgery or physiotherapy depending upon what kind of an injury your athlete has suffered they have to back then that's when post their rehab is when you bring them back to play which again is your job and at the end of the day you cannot over emphasize prevention ever so it always has to recycle back to preventing further injuries to that same athlete and his skin all right so acute care is something which we all know as rice now there are certain individuals who have come up with something called price with p being preservation of function it basically doesn't make much sense it's basically rice it's rest that's absolutely essential if your athlete comes to you with injury the first thing you do is discourage them to continue playing and it's basically again common sense you ask them to use ice the maximum duration of ice which can be used is 20 minutes however i ask my athletes to restrict that to 10 minutes per se if you're using ice packs directly on the skin for more than 10 minutes then you have chances of a skin burn so maximum 20 minutes 10 minutes is what is advisable compression if the area has swelling or if the area can develop swelling especially around the ankle or the knee it is better for you to put a compression bandage there and obviously you elevate the injured limb so if you do rise properly you have taken care of the injury and that's the best you can do please do not and i repeat please do not if you're not trained in reducing dislocations again i know you may be one of the doctors on the field who may be on national television and it will look pretty heroic for you to reduce that shoulder don't do it if you're not trained you're going to injure the athlete further um next please pain control nsaids is the best uh, be beware although wada does not have anything against nsaids but wada does have uh, recommendations against using steroids on the field of play or soon um, you know the steroids are considered even local steroids can get you in trouble if the urine shows it so if you are if there is an athlete who is within the season and you're going to use steroids on him 
discourage yourself from doing it because you may be throwing him out of the field of play for a long time. Temporary slaps and splints using a, a, a simple old POP is the best in my opinion, but there are fancy stuffs like Sam Splint which you can get pretty cheap in the market. And your ambulances or your clinics or your hospitals can easily stock a few of those. Uh, X-ray CTs, MRIs, we all know that they are the mainstay or the workhorse for diagnosing sports injuries. But over the last five to six years, and especially now also in our city like Jaipur, we've got four or five radiologists who are trained in use of ultrasound for diagnosing tendon and muscle injuries. So that's something. If you have a, if you especially see a patient in your practice who is claustrophobic, who doesn't want an MRI to be done for their shoulder or knee injuries, well, you can't emphasize ultrasound more than this. I mean, and there are very good radiologists in Jaipur. I know a few of those who are doing an excellent job in dynamic ultrasound and diagnosing those injuries. So, you know, that's one take-home message that ultrasound is an option for you to diagnose, especially sports injuries um, of any part of the body. Now, when you bring surgeries, we are not going to discuss, obviously, that becomes too specific. But back to play, the physiotherapy has an important role. So, that's, all I, that's what I tell my patients always, that orthopedic surgery is 20% surgery, 80% physiotherapy. So have a good physiotherapy team backing your surgeries. You can't have a successful orthopedic surgery without a good physiotherapist helping you out. So the patient eventually has to go through those phases of uh, physio. Phase one is getting that motion back in the joint which has been operated or it has been injured. Phase two is regaining the basic function. Then you develop strength and eventually you do the sports specific, specific conditioning. A ballpark figure for if somebody, suppose you have a family member or your athletes or, or one of your patients or the relatives come to you and say, sir, our operation was hai, ligament ka ya shoulder ka and when, is, when, when we can get back to play, well, um, for you to give a safe answer, not before six months, right? So irrespective of whatever the fancy advertisement you see, unfortunately, by our surgeons nowadays, um, going to field of play before six months is going to end up with a disaster. So you're not supposed to do it. Um, also, if you happen to see a patient who comes to you for physiotherapy advice or for any other advice, it always um, you know pays to pays for you to send the patient back to the operating surgeon. Unfortunately, we see a lot of patients who want our second opinions post their surgery. Doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, so I'll finish it with an illustrative case. This was an 18-year-old basketball player whose uh, ACL surgery had done a few years back when he was 60, when he was 15. So three years down the line, he comes back to me again. He has a history of fall while playing. He was going for a shot and he was tackled and he fell with the left knee in extension and he fell on his bum. See, his, um, the acute care was given on the, off the field and he was brought to us with the inability to bear weight on the left limb um, and there was a severe pain in the left buttock. We did some investigations. Can I have the next, next slide on, please? Uh, on the clinical examination, the patient was walking on walker tota. She couldn't really bear any weight. There was tenderness on the left ischial tuberosity, and there was um, painful resisted knee flexion, and there was a gross weakness in his hamstring muscle. So, yes, he had a... Can I have the other slide, please? So, he had a proximal tear of um, the hamstring. So, if you look at that, that's the ischial tuberosity, and that's how a normal would look like and there was this tear you see that white thing going in that's where the tear was so he had a he had a near total tear of the proximal hamstring attachment um, can we have the next slide please this is a video showing that tear sorry for all that blood post lunch but uh, orthopedic surgeons love that so that's the hamstring we are flexing and, and, and extending the knee the ischial tuberosity is up top near that retractor where I'll be taking it there so it's come, it's retracted by about a couple of centimeters, and that is where the muscle should have been. So we repaired it with two suture anchors. Can I have the slide again, please? The next one. Yes, so that's uh, the next one, please. The next slide. Yeah, so that's uh, up top. You can see a few, five, few uh, of those uh, sutures from the anchor, and that's post the repair. And, and here, this was somewhere in 2020, October, and now we have the, the other two videos, not in the presentation. And now we have the same um, gentleman, an year and a half. So uh, rather a little less than a year. So it's about June 2021 when he came to us for the follow-up. Jadu Alag videos hai. Outside the presentation, please.
Yep, so that's the man and uh, he's back to normal. So back to all, these are called plyometric jumps and that's the, that's the farther, farthest you can take your patient post-surgery. Can you have the other one, him, him doing squats? By the way, this, this man was in the under-17 basketball Indian team. They won the, the under-17 basketball world championship in Thailand in 2017. Uh, that's it. So I'm done with my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aditya Sol, sir. Only one question for you. As a practicing doctor, what are some of the most common sports injuries are injuries you encounter and what advice or tips do you have for early diagnosis, effective management to facilitate athletes' speedy recovery and return to play? All right, so the, the two, let me just focus on two which I see commonly. The first and the foremost is dehydration. It's not musculoskeletal injury. The commonest sports injury, irrespective of whatever sport you're playing, is dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. So that's something which you need to, you, you need to teach your athletes about. And the other is uh, musculoskeletal injuries because of poor recovery. So most of us, when we go to the go to that to the gym, most of us, if we go to the gym or we start playing a new sport, we end up not recovering well. We end up either exercising all those seven days or you know trying to compromise sleep. Most of us are busy doctors. You get up at 4:30 for a gym at 5:30, and then you're in your OT at 7 o'clock, work till 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the night, and then you're back in the you uh, in the bed for about four to five hours before you get back again. Stop doing this. Have at least six to seven hours of good night's sleep. Otherwise, you will eventually end up with an injury. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aditya. Now I'll request Dr. Ravi Gupta, sir. So we'll request Dr. Uh, Ravi Gupta, sir. Dr. Ravi Gupta is HOD and director at Eternal Hospital. So Dr. Ravi will talk about the recent advances in urology. So give a big round of applause for Dr. Ravi Gupta, sir. So Dr. Ravi, more than 100 doctors are connected online, so they will be also having their questions. So after your presentation, uh, we will have two to three questions for you. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Nitesh. And a warm welcome for on, on this eternal uh, conclave. Uh, it's a be very boring session post-lunch, we all understand. So I'll try to be more crisp. Uh, the attendance is too short, I am afraid. Uh, so I'll try to be more crisp and more pictorial so that we don't get further bored and I'll be very short. So in the, uh, I'll be just uh, you know, uh, highlighting the recent advances in the field of urology. So we all know that there's a gradual transition uh, from open to the minimal invasive approach uh, in, in all fields of surgery. So we have worked uh, immensely in the field of urology. Next slide. Okay, fine. So, so we, we all, as a surgeon, we all are well versed with these kind of long incisions, which depicts any kind of renal surgeries for nephrectomy, pyeloplasty, uh, for stone surgeries. These were the pretty common earlier. But now with this invent of all these five important techniques, which is the mini perk, the micro PCNL, the RIRS, laparoscopy, and laser. So these are the five uh, you know, innovations in the field of urology, uh, which make uh, our life easier, our patients' life easier, and their recovery is much faster than before. So it's a, it's a 10 minute talk. Um, so I'll be you know, trying to be more crisp and faster on this. So I'll just touch one by one all these five pictures. So for the renal stones, as we have uh, seen, uh, there was big incisions earlier. Uh, but now these days we are dealing with the mini puck. Mini puck is even a miniature form of the PCNL. We all, all know about the PCNL where we make a small puncture about one centimeter at the back. And then we retrieve the whatever size of stone. So that the, there's no need of open pyelolithotomy. But, but there's further in, uh, you know, advancement with that we are doing with the mini perk. There's hardly a 5 mm uh, cut at the back. And through the laser, with a smaller nephroscope, with a smaller puncture, and with the help of laser, we retrieve the, uh, the stones. Next slide. Next slide, please. So it's an intracorporeal picture where we see a small hole, and with the laser, we can lace the stone. So the you know, whatever the size, the stone can be pulverized 
and the incident size it even 5 mm next slide so further advancement with this even we don't need to do a 5 mm puncture uh, we do a micro pcnl in which there is an 18 part it's a 16 part uh, 16 gauge 3 part needle uh, can you further uh, you know, yeah so it's a needle it's a 16 gauge needle we have to just you know uh, poke from the back to the kidney and then through the laser fiber we can lace the stones so even the puncture is not done even not even the 5 millimeter puncture is done you have to just put in a needle inside lace the stone and come out so it's a advancement for the renal stones next slide further announcement in all these three techniques whatever we talk of pcnl mini pcnl or micro pcnl we have to approach through the back we have to make a puncture in the kidney in the further advancement this is RARS. I've been doing this since last 15 years. This is a retrograde intrarenal surgery in which we do not tamper the kidney tissue at all. We go from below in, an, in a retrograde manner from the urethra to the bladder to the ureter up to the kidney. And we deal, uh, you know, all kind of pathology in the kidney. Made, there are further indications I'll be talking about later through the urethra. So this is RARS. Next slide. Yeah. So these are the indications. The most common indication, the most commonly used this technique is in the renal stone. We can deal up to 2 cm or sometimes 2.5 cm stones can be dealt easily with this technique. So there is no need for so. So I do not do PCNL or micro or the mini PCNL for a stone up to 2.5 cm because now we have RARS. Another indication is uh, after lithotripsy if we have residual stones. If after PCNL for the staghorn stones, if there's a if, if there are residual stones, we can do the RARS. Uh, there's other other indications to evaluate why the patient is having bleeding. Uh, the uh, to evaluate the upper tract positive cytology for the TCC tumor or as well, and for the treatment of PUJ and for the migrated foreign body. So these these are the indications for the RARS. Next slide, please. So this is a flexible ureteroscope. We can see. The tip of the flexible ureteroscope has got, you know, 270 uh, degree movement in either direction. So from below we can reach up to each and every calyx of the kidney. Next, please. So as we as we can see, can I have a pointer? Do we have a pointer? No. So can we on the left side? Can we have a radio opaque shadow in the renal area that depicts the renal stone? Yeah, please. Thank you. So here we can see it's a radio opaque shadow in the left uh, uh, renal area. From below we put in an excess sheath and through that excess sheath we introduce the flexible ureteroscope and with the laser fiber we lace the stone. So the stone is all gone, is all gone after the surgery. So that's the beauty of this. So the recent advances I've talked about, uh, you know, the micro PCNL, I've talked about the RARS, the role of laparoscopy we all know. Uh, there's no need to talk further on this uh, and for that and in the passing note I'll be commenting on the renal transplant so these are the few pictures I just wanted to show you these are all my own patients since last 25 years of practice can you just go back so yeah we can see the stone bulk so this is a stone bulk and these kind of stone bulk can be dealt in a with a single puncture in a single sitting next please so these kind of stones can also be dealt in a single sitting we have removed the single sitting, although these big stones cannot be dealt with the RIRS. Obviously, we have to do the PCNL, but the stone bulk is no longer a contraindication for us. Next slide. For stone in the kidney, we do that. For stone in the ureter, we have the options of laparoscopic ureter lithotomy. Next, please. What if, if the patient has an ectopic kidney? So this patient has an left cross ectopia, where the left kidney was lying below the right kidney. And it has it harbored the stone inside. So we have done a laparoscopic assisted PCNL for the ectopic kidney. So, so virtually for each and every case, we don't need to have uh, to do an open surgery. For a urethroplasty, urethral stricture, the options is a buccal mucosal urethroplasty. We harvest a buccal graft from the uh, oral cavity and apply on the urethra. So this is a definitive treatment. It's up three months after RGU, which suggests the structure is all gone. Next, please. For a female urethral stricture, nowadays we are we see uh, the, the young females having the strictures. They they require repeated dilatations because of the bad urethra. For for them also, 
we can uh, just go back no uh, forward yeah next yes so can you just see the urophometry this young lady which would be around 35 year old female have a, just a flat uroflow so she was hardly passing any urine because of the stricture so these she requires repeated dilations so we have done a buccal graph urethroplasty on her and now after 5 years of follow up she is all fine for a female for the stress urinary incontinence a trans obturator taping is a, just a 10 minute job for us under spinal anesthesia and pa patients become continent after that next please so this laser machine has done wonder uh, since last 15 years to at least to me because uh, um, we've been doing TURP since last 22 years but last 15 years i am doing the holap which is a holmium laser enucleation of prostate i'll be just showing a quick video for the holap if the time allows so this is the holap this is the prostatic lobe we have got two lobes left lateral right lateral and this is the medial lobe so with this holap the beauty of this uh, prostate surgery with the laser machine is it's a, it's a, number one it is absolutely bloodless we hardly see a, even a drop of blood even post surgery number two patient do not need to stop antiplatelets so the cardiac patients who even or ecosprin clopidogrel or a dual antiplatelets they not they need not to stop the antiplatelets so number two is we do not need to stop that number 3 you know after you know certain experience you can do it in a much faster manner and you can do absolute radical job radical job means because you dissect the adeno you dissect between the capsule and the adenoma so there is no tissue which is left behind so there is no regrowth of tissue after the this holap surgery so this is absolutely wonderful procedures i remove the catheter on the next day and the patient's voids well i think we are done with it we can just go ahead next slide so there are a few pictures patient has got a re, uh, right renal uh, tumor we have done the laparoscopic radical nephrectomy and from this incision we normally retrieve the kidney it's a fenestral incision or about 7 to 8 cm same on the left side next picture these are the few specimen so the about 20 20 cm or 25 cm renal tumor can easily be dealt with the laparoscopy yes next now we are dealing much more with the renal conservation we do not want to compromise the kidney until uh, it is indicated so in this patient we can see it's an upper polar tumor on the right side where the entire kidney removal is not needed we can easily do a partial nephrectomy next please so this is a tumor on the upper pole next please and it is a specimen uh, of the uh, uh, tumor and we have preserved the kidney so radical uh, laparoscopic partial nephrectomy is a routine thing for us now next next please this is young female patient has got bilateral pheochromocytoma she has ab about 15 cm adrenal tumors on the both side having high blood pressure so we have dealt both at the same time and you see we have not tampered with her beauty as well next please vvf repair can be dealt with it next please next please we we do a lot of pediatric work like the psychoeurotic reflux is one of the thing so this this boy has a bilateral psychoeurotic reflux we have done a uretic reimplantation next please and after the uretic reimplantation there is virtually no reflux so there is no reflux on the other side next please pg obstruction pelvic uretic junction pelvic uretic junction obstruction is a very very common entity in the uh, Uh, infants or in the you know puberty age group and we do with the laparoscopic pyeloplasty yes please next please so we have re uh, under the reconstruction and this is the next please so there is no tamper with the body yes next please next please next please we do lot of you know uh, uh, you know uh, andrology work as well patient comes to us with the penile curvature and you know uh, which causes them difficult uh, uh, coitus so we do the penile curvature correction yes please next please so this is a penile curvature surgery you know the advanced tumors which sometime invades into the ivc because of the ignorance or whatever the reason maybe the patient presentation would be late if the tumor goes in the ivc so then then we also deal you know the nephrectomy along with the ivc thrombectomy so we've done a lot of cases next 
patient has invasive see a bladder bladder cancer going outside the bladder in which uh, the entire bladder is removed and through the intestine we make an um, artificial bladder and anastomosis orthotropically at the same time so patient does not need to have an ileostomy over it so this is a follow up of the patient now the final touch that the transplant i have done myself about more hundred more than 100 transplants at eternal next we we do all you know our donor nephrectomy by laparoscopy next next please so this is the anastomosis the, the venous anastomosis we do with the external leg -like vein and next please the artery depends mostly we do with the external leg -like artery next please and opening the clamp we normally have a bridge diuresis and then the ureteric implant is done next please this is a small video donor i think i'm done with it it's a donor video how do we retrieve with donor i think we'll i'll show it some other time next please next please so these are the few happy moments of the transplant you, you, you just skip the slides just skip the slides yeah so at the end i would like to say thank you so much we should keep calm and donate come forward to donate a kidney thank you so much i'll be happy if, if you have any query any question nitesh yes sir yeah so uh, so in light of recent uh, developments how important is continue medical education for urologists to stay updated with the latest trends and technologies in in this field and are there any specific resources or platform you recommend for ongoing professional development i think it's a very valid question to be updated is is you know the crux of the medical science we need to be updated every 5 years because the science is you know technology is fastly changing every 5 years we see the some other aspect when when we were you know uh, studying then most of the time we were taught about the open surgery when we turned up step up into the practice the laparoscopy come then you know the radical nephrectomy then the partial nephrectomy then the laser came now we talk about robotic so you know continued medical education is a is a platform which which teaches us to you know keep us updated so it's very essential so with this online platforms there are so much society these are uh, which is now coming up so we have to be you know very much acquainted with these kind of platforms so keep us keep us updated thank you very much sir for your thoughts yeah 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 ma'am if uh, someone can uh, pass the mic to ma'am sorry please Post uh, menopausal women. Yeah, post. I mean, it's the incontinence is a very very common common entity, yeah, and true. it's normally it's a very very hidden kind of thing. People, yeah. mm. especially female, they they do not come forward, you yeah. know, to us. Ah. So if the people are whosoever listen to us, people or the females especially yes. and the yes. genetic, you know, age group should come to us. Mm. We have to evaluate them okay. because there are certain indication, there are certain diseases. which enhances the incontinence mm -hmm. you know which predisposes mm -hmm. them for the incontinence so mm -hmm. we need to you know find out the reason for it okay. but make sure you have the treatment mm -hmm. we have good medications we have even the small good surgeries for them if it is indicated but they should come forward talk to us we will evaluate them and we'll definitely treat them but uh, that is not possible because they are not attended to in the family itself because after like 60 50s and all it's a burden on the family who is going to feed the family it's a kadwa such they hardly feed the people also and uh, how how can we expect someone to concentrate on the incontinence also? so what i uh, request or because you people are uh, seniors in that and your um, double graduates if you can uh, sh show some light on it so that some central or state government uh, plans are there now we have so many uh, Uh, plans for the geriatric age group, age group like uh, artificial dentures like that and the same thing with the bph people also over there. most of them are geriatric people 
so they suffer a lot the, the life itself will be a suffering for them so they are usually opt for a death because they nobody will be next to them because of the nuisance so if government takes some action and to attend to them at least uh, at least you people can talk to the uh, respectable governments whenever you are attend See, to the thing is you have open a pandora box i would say this because yeah, yeah. you know neglected you know people or mm. the as, as you age if mm. you are neglected of the family mm. it's a very very you know vast yes. vast you know topic mm. to discuss about it mm. but i think the ngo should come forward mm. who can really help them mm. because the only the ngos government as we all know the intention of the government i mean the these guys are keep themselves changing every 5 years they have their their own vested interest yeah, so yeah. i should not talk about that yeah. but the ngos who who does it on their own mm. if you if, if they work in a very honest manner okay. i think they can be you know uh, the partial solution for these kind of problems how how about the success rate because it's mouth to mouth to ear uh, publicity one if one case is not there means hundred of people will never patients will never turn up to us so i would just like to know keeping the age and the damages which has occurred according to the age group yes. what is the success rate of all these See, surgeries See, if the treatment is done hmm. keeping the indications in view yeah keeping if the you common indications common okay. indication yeah. you you have to evaluate each and every person hmm. why he or she is having this problem hmm. if the urologist hmm. is competent enough to do the things with the proper indications okay it's 100% success the only flaw when you are you know rushing through the treatment you mm. don't have time mm. you don't give you know listen to the patient and you do not address the problem okay if it is properly indicated mm. then the treatment is bound to you know do the miracles to them thank you thank, thank you, thank you so, so much thank you very much dr ravi and one more question for you can you discuss the potential impact of these recent advances on patient outcome and quality of life for individuals with urological issues and how have these advancement changes changed the landscape of urological care so these are the online questions we are getting from uh, various doctors who are connected online so if you can answer yes yes the the, the whole idea of you know presenting this topic as a recent advances <laughs> okay fine just two minutes for two minutes the the whole idea of you know th this is i have talked i have discussed about you know the recent thing which definitely makes an impact on the patient life you need not to punch of the kidney rrs is the answer you need no there is no hyponatremia there is no sodium depletion after trp surgery we have an option of holap you don't need to cut the patient's uh, you know belly you have laparoscopy with us for the transplant even the donor need not to cut his body donor uh, we do with the laparoscopy even for the recipient we are doing the robotic radic uh, robotic you know transplants even the incisions are so uh, so small so with this further advancement definitely the patient body is least tampered and and the results are definitely better thank you sir thank you so much thank you so give a big round of applause for dr ravi sir and uh, now i will request dr poonam ma'am so uh, will request dr poonam ma'am for the next presentation so dr poonam is uh, director of obs and gynae at eternal hospital jaipur so over to ma'am good afternoon everybody uh, i would be talking about menopause a challenge which every woman must take because it is inevitable and fortunately it is predictable so we'll be talk about how should we plan the second innings of our life so they are going to look at this next because uh, there is some technical some problem so you can you will say next एवरीबडी Uh, by definition we would say menopause is permanent cessation of menstruation at the end of reproductive life 
and it is due to loss of ovarian follicular activity. This process happens in phases. So the phase of menopause is usually broken down into four categories. One is pre-menopause, which is the transition phase between menopause into menopause, which typically lasts about six to eight years. So while you are still menstruating to the phase when you stop menstruating, there is pre-menopause. And finally, with the decline in reproductive hormones, there is a time when you cease to men uh, menstruate for at least 12 months in a row, which is called finally menopause. And then is the time after menopause, which is the time after uh, menopause happens and you are postmenopausal for the rest of your life. So this entire phase of pre-menopausal and postmenopausal period is called a perimenopause. And it revolves around the time of menopause. It describes the time when the hormones begin to decline and menstrual cycles become erratic and irregular. With these hormonal changes and in the transition phase, the ups and downs in the hormones, they lead to lots of difficulties, which a female face, faces during the perimenopausal phase. Like you may experience vaginal dryness, hot flashes, chills, night sweats, sleep problems. Mood changes, very common. You will find many females complaining that it isn't the same now. You are unable to tolerate stress the same like you were earlier. You get very irritable. You may experience change in your behavior, responses to different situations, and you may not even realize why things are changing. There is tendency for weight gain and slowed metabolism. You may feel you are not being able to digest things the way you were digesting earlier. You are not performing the way your body is not performing the way it used to be performing earlier. There is thinning of hair, dryness of skin, and even loss of breastfulness. All these changes which are taking place in the perimenopause or premenopause phase cause a lot of discomfort because this transition before you even realize is happening starts troubling you in subtle ways. But like I said, nowadays females are pretty active. 40, 50, 45 to 55 is the average menopausal age and perimenopause is a period which may extend up to six to eight years, sometimes even 10 years. So before a female really realizes these are menopausal symptoms or perimenopausal symptoms, she struggles with these thinking there is some change in herself and attributes it to so many other things. There are not just changes, there can be major health hazards because of these hormonal changes in your body. The most common to be and most uh, significantly to be affected are your cardiovascular system, your bones and your urinary tract symptom, so, uh, system. So what you face is higher risk for cardiovascular disease, higher risk for osteoporosis and higher risk for urinary tract infections. But finally, how do you deal with menopause? Because it is predictable, it is inevitable, you should deal with it with a very positive mindset. I would like to quote Ofra Winfrey here, the most important journey of your life doesn't necessarily involve climbing the highest peak or trekking around the world. The biggest adventure you can ever take is to live the lives of your dreams. So menopause is not the end. You may face so many uh, changes in your body, but yet there's a long way to go. What you should be doing actually is prepare well in advance for this inevitable and anticipated change. Do the best for your body because being proactive is indeed empowering. When you know there is menopause likely later in your age, you should read about it, know what changes are likely to come in your body, understand them, and then there is something known as preventive medicine, which we are so much talking about. So whenever you talk about physiology and you read it, you understand it, and you yet cannot prevent it from becoming a pathology is not acceptable. Females should know that with change of time, they are going to undergo hormonal changes, which if not addressed timely, proactively, may make them prone to diseases. So definitely the complaints which we fo uh, come across in menopause can be addressed timely if we start foreseeing menopause. What are the ways to prepare then? You should get baseline readings. What we are so much into nowadays, screening tests are available. You should screen and get your baseline readings so that you know what your hormones are like, what does your kidney work like, what are your liver tests looking like, and any change can catch things early. You can 
if suffering from significant complaints which are hampering your day to day activity or your functioning you can even consider hrt or hormone replacement therapy which can help relieve your symptoms so when we talk about preventive medicine we can also talk about therapeutic rather than suffering with your complaints in isolation you can always approach and ask for hormone replacement therapy for relief from significant complaints like vaginal atrophy and hot flashes maintaining healthy weight this is very important because one of your most friendly hormones estrogen which is going to leave you during menopause it helps you look the young keep you fit in so many ways that after it is withdrawn you are prone for cardiovascular diseases and other factors which affect your cardiovascular system most important stands out to be your weight so maintaining a healthy weight goes a long way in controlling your menopausal cardiovascular effects you should strengthen your bones females during their lives have a phase called a reproductive phase where they are child bearing every child which a boy, lady delivers takes away so much from her body that the uh, replacement of these uh, uh, nutrients has to be very uh, sensitively and appropriately looked into to get the desired results the deficiency that is created during these reproductive years if not corrected will definitely lead to weaker bones which are anyway going to happen in menopause so you have to be very serious about your bone health no to smoking smoking is not for females at all when young it may affect your child bearing and in menopause it worsens your both cardiovascular risk as well as your bone health manage your stress the middle age now comes with a lot of responsibilities and with females becoming active in so many fields stress part is definitely more managing your stress helps you settle your hormones in many ways so when you know that you are entering menopause learn to keep your stress under control be vocal about your problems settle them at early stages rather than letting them become big problems for you and entertain your hobbies you know uh, being happy and entertaining hobbies it it belittles your problems so sometimes being alone in stress makes you uh, see even small things as big problems and being happy with your hobbies enjoying what you are doing helps belittle your problems most importantly we would like to talk about bone health facts because in india what we see is this is most affected uh, even those females who should otherwise be actually fit and fine by 50 60 start looking old and are most complaining about their bone weaknesses we should know something very important about our bones with women's bones they grow until the age of 18 or 20 years when this is supported by the hormone estrogen small gains can continue up to 30 years the estrogen that we are uh, blessed with is actually protective against breakdown so optimal bone mineral density which depends on calcium magnesium phosphorus vitamin d vitamin k should be taken in plenty during these building years that is the age group before 20 and even up to less than 30 years which is nowadays changing but was the reproductive age group also so they after you are cross your 30 and uh, reach uh, in the perimenopausal age group there is rapid decline in estrogen so after 50 when your menopausal it accelerates the bone loss with 20% loss in the 5 to 7 years of menopause so if you have not been storing your calcium appropriately in your young days you are very likely to replenish your stores very fast the fastest rate is in the first 2 years so 5 to 7 years is when you're losing but in the first 2 years you lose most of it so after knowing all this you at least understand that you actually need an action plan for menopause so all these years when you're looking after others health your family's health you ought to know what is menopause health also how do you overcome your problems lifestyle changes can help women manage the physical and emotional symptoms of menopause what are these lifestyle changes we females um, if we talk about india we're already looking after everything that was domestic was your responsibility your children your family and yourself now you are even loaded with other responsibilities which are outside your career uh, your outside responsibilities financial and so many other things so with uh, your time being more occupied by so many other things 
a little change and prioritizing your health helps you manage your problems better. But all these uh, responsibilities which you have taken over, they take a lot of toll on your physical and emotional well-being. Anger is something which is very killing for anybody for that matter. But in females, with so many responsibilities coming up, this can be managed with a little meditation and organizing yourself better. You have to learn to handle your stress better if you want a better health in your later age group. Another important thing is dietary changes. Very few of us really take our diet seriously, especially like I told you, it is the first 30 years of your life which are, which are very important for you when you're constructing your body and helping it become strong. So that all those stores which you create then help you live your menopause better. These dietary changes are same as you advise others. You have to have a lot of antioxidants in your diet. The bone health, which depends on calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, vitamin K, have to be replenished timely. So in your reproductive years, when you are childbearing, and even earlier, when you, or the girl is growing, you ought to be very serious about diet. Socialization. Being occupied only with your family has been one of the reasons why menopausal symptoms became very obvious. Earlier, we studies show that those living in joint families or in rural areas where they're occupied by family and family affairs complain less about menopausal symptoms. Females who are lonely are at a stage of life where they cease to make friends because they are so much alone, away from family, and at a stage where you, you know, your subordinates are not your friends. You have to be boss above them. So that also actually worsens your symptoms. So socialization is one thing which has been distinctly known to uh, rather uh, help relieve your menopausal symptoms. If despite all the efforts that you take to keep yourself healthy, you ha happen to land up with problems, you really do not have to live with them. There are treatment and options available, non-hormonal therapies available, mind and body changes, cognitive behavioral therapy. Nowadays, yoga is so much in vogue and being talked about, it actually helps. It helps you get together your mind and body, get them into alignment and work for your own good. All these therapies have been known to work very well with aging females. Medications are available for symptoms which are really troublesome. Most common is hot flashes. Uh, Peroxetin, which is the only selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, is known to help and you can definitely ask for it in case you are suffering from hot flashes to the extent that it is interfering in your day-to-day -day activity. Hot flashes are episodes of extreme warmth where you suddenly start sweating, feel a lot of warmth all over your body, particularly face. And the episodes can be as frequent as 8 to 10 times in a day, which are actually very disturbing. Weight loss is something so important, it can never be overemphasized. Because the cardiovascular disease risk increases with aging, it is important that women who are overweight or obese, they should start addressing it to avoid greater discomfort. For vaginal dryness, you have vaginal lubricants available. And particularly in dietary changes, it is important that you stop and avoid intake of alcohol, caffeine, and spicy food. And add vitamin E and flaxseed oils to your diet, which are antioxidants. If we talk about specific therapy, the entire menopausal syndrome is a result of estrogen deficiency. So the mainstay of hormonal therapy is estrogen. But it is used standalone only for patients or women who have been hysterectomized or do not have a uterus inside, so that the risk of endometrial carcinoma with estrogen replacement is not there. Those who have a uterus in situ, they need estrogen and progesterone together, sequentially, one after the other, just like it is physiologically available in a body. So this decreases the risk of endometrial cancer. Combinations of estrogen and progesterone may also be recommended. But although HRT does relieve you from symptoms, but it is not without its own side effects. So the replacement has to be with a lot of caution. When you give HRT, even with the uterus uh, hysterectomized patient, the risk of endometrial cancer can be avoided, but risk of breast cancer still remains. So you cannot use HRT indefinitely and has to be used with a serious note of caution. 
there are some uh, lesser estrogenic drugs which are available with lesser side effects like subdermal implants, percutaneous estrogen gels, tibolone, progestins which have estrogenic uh, element component of effect also and a transdermal patch. All said and done, menopause has lots of problems. It has lots of uh, ways of addressing and you can walk into menopause also with a lot of dignity but it is not without lots of benefits also. With menopause, there are no more menses, which means no more premenstrual syndrome. There are no menstrual headaches. There are no pregnancy fears. If you have had fibroids, you may see them shrinking after menopause. And there is increased time for self, because now you are retired from your family's responsibilities. And you can enjoy yourself all alone with your friends or whichever way. So I believe wholeheartedly that age is a mindset. Biologically is what it is, but I truly believe it's more about how you feel. How you feel in your body and how you feel about your body. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now I will request uh, for the next presentation. For the next presentation, I will request Dr. Sunil Aroda, sir. Dr. Sunil Aroda, sir, will talk about the art and science of natural hair transplant, a game changer. Thank you, Mitesh. Uh, so being the last speaker, I think I have been given the toughest task to keep everyone awake. Thank God. So, next please. Uh, I would be speaking on natural hair transplant and what kind of science and art is involved in this. Next please. I have nothing to disclose. Next please. So, why is it natural hair transplant important? And why do we say that artistry and science both are involved? When we talk about natural hair transplant, it is the hair transplant which is actually inconspicuous and which is not uh, distinctly visible. And it involves artistry in the sense in designing hairline, in distributing, dividing the hair, in giving the proper direction to the hair follicles, and science in retracting, in retrieving the hair from the donor area and implanting them safely and alive uh, into the recipient area. And uh, this artistry is actually uh, pretty significant for uh, a plastic surgeon, especially when we do a hair transplant or any facial aesthetic procedure because those are our signatures on patient's body which are distinctly visible to the public. Next please. So when we, uh, I'll, I'll take my talk, uh, I'll, I'll speak actually retrospectively in reverse order. I'll show you what can happen if we do not follow the basic principles, the artistry and the science of doing a hair transplant. So what can happen and uh, what kind of impact it uh, have on the patients and how we can improve those conditions. Ne uh, next please. So when we do a unnatural hair transplant or a bad hair transplant with disregard to artistry and science of hair transplant, it can be because of error in planning and judgment or error in technique or because of any complication. Next please. Error in planning or judgment uh, is usually on the part of the treating doctor. We need to understand that hair loss is progressive and unpredictable. So we should avoid doing a hair transplant at an early age. Then. Uh, there should be a proper planning of hairline. The hairline should be uh, with should be age age appropriate with a straight. It should not be a straight design, and we should not ignore the normal contour of the frontotemporal angle. So, as in this patient, we can see. Can I have the mark? Uh, this patient actually has already been operated for hair transplant, and he was when when he was operated upon, his age was 21, so he was operated upon at an early age, and hair hair were. Uh, front part only. As his age progressed, the back of the head started growing bald, and this is the kind of look he was having uh, after four or five years, which is absolutely unnatural. And he was rather he rather preferred uh, kept shaving his head. Next, please. So uh, this is. I'll, I'll just rush through the slide so that uh, it will be more. This is another example. Can can we make out any anything in this picture and in this picture? 
This patient also has been operated for hair transplant with complete disregard to the artistry and science of hair transplant with unnatural direction, distribution, very less density, uh, loss of hair follicle. In fact, the transplant has been done on forehead, not on the scalp, as we can see. Next, please. Again, especially in females, when we do the hair transplant, this unnatural appearance, we call it a Barbie doll hairline appearance, which is, uh, again, when we ignore the artistry and science, then straight hairline, straight hairline, again, with poor density and abnormal direction and distribution of the hair follicles. Next, please. So when we repair these kind of cases, this involves artistry and science in the sense that we have to take the hairline to a proper level. We have to design a proper natural looking hair. We have to keep a proper direction distribution of the hair follicles so that and, and our aim should be to restore natural appearance and self confidence. Next, please. The distinct challenges which we face. Uh, because of these problems are that there are there is a lot of patient skepticism the, the, that that uh, hairline is unnatural looking then the do donor area which has already been consumed in first procedure it has got a poor density so limited donor area and scarred recipient and not donor area next patient skepticism these kind of patients because the procedure has already been done on them and uh, they are having a very unnatural kind of uh, appearance of the hairline of the scalp these patients have both emotional scars because of these, uh, uh, this unnatural appearance and physical scars of the previous surgery. And because of this, they develop distrust for the transplant patient. So a preoperative consultation and counseling is of utmost importance to give patient a realistic and, realistic and honest uh, uh, this thing, understanding of the procedure. And there has to be uh, realistic expectations has to be set at both the ends, at the end of the doctor, the treating physician and as well as the patient. So when we correct the natural hairline, what exactly we do? So in this uh, slide, I can show what kind of changes we can make. So in this patient, as the hairline was uh, actually, it, it's almost non-existing because of previous hair transplant. We corrected this hairline, maintaining the direction distribution of the proper hair follicles gave a M-shaped hairline pattern to the patient, extracted hair follicles from the forehead. Next, please. And this patient again, in the, the, the unnatural hairline, the hair follicles were removed, and natural direction and distribution of the hair follicle was given, and this was the difference. We can appreciate the natural look, the smart look, in fact, what we say, and uh, we call it a smart line, actually. This is not a natural hairline, this is a smart line. Next, please. And if the donor area is not adequate. We can extract hair follicles from other parts of the body like from chest or from uh, beard area as well. Next. So when the scar, uh, next please, leave, leave this slide. So this is a uh, first case example, which I'll, I can explain in detail. So this was the same patient with hair transplanted on the forehead. The correction was done. This was the slitting which was done. The space created to transplant the extracted hair this is the hairline design we created we mi with micro irregularities at the level of the hairline. A proper m shape pattern was given. And from forehead, the abnormally transplanted hair were removed. A good density was given in the scalp with maintaining proper direction and distribution of the hair follicle. Next, please. This is again the top view of the same patient, uh, just depicting the areas of distribution. Same patient, same patient, same patient. This is the difference it can make. So once this that the when we give disregard to the artistry and science of hair transplant and hair transplant is done in an improper manner this is the look a patient gets and when okay next please when the proper hairline proper direction proper distribution and density is maintained this is the transformation we can, we can give and these kind of transformations actually boost self confidence of the patients and improve their quality of life next please same patient lateral view same patient uh, lateral view uh, the kid in which the hair transplant was done earlier at the age of 21. When, we, when he came to us, his age was 25. So we corrected his, hair hair, hair, his damaged hair transplant. We just uh, moved his hairline slightly upwards and extracted hair from these, this area. Then this area, all of this area was transplanted. Next, please. Again, uh, next, please. Same patient, post-procedure uh, picture. Next, please. This is the difference uh, a natural looking hair transplant can make in the personality of a patient. Next please. Again, female patient with Barbie doll 
uh, hairline appearance. Correction was done with micro and macro irregularities were inserted at the hairline level. Uh, this is post transplant. Next, please. This is uh, pre procedure, and the second one is post procedure, which is looking absolutely natural hairline. Next. So, uh, to conclude, the most desirable option is primary hair transplant. So, we should avoid doing hair transplant at very young age. Uh, we should avoid creating a juvenile hairline. We should avoid operating on a high grade baldness patients with poor donia, and we should avoid over harvesting of the donor area. Next, please. And sometimes, in some cases, neither artistry nor science works actually in hair transplant. And then we have to say no. Next. Like in this patient, where the demand is huge, the recipient area or the area of baldness is very big as compared to the donor area. We cannot do a hair transplant in this patient. Next, please. Similarly, another patient with tower-shaped head, huge uh, area of baldness and limited uh, supply of hair follicles. The, these patients, we should say always say no to these kind of patients. Next, please. So take home message is primary procedure at first is the best option. Patient counseling and realistic expectations and goals should be set at both the levels, the treating physician as well as the patient. Proper pre-revision evaluation and planning is must. A meticulous technique and it, it may require more than multiple sessions, more than one sessions. If done properly, it helps restore patients' natural look, self-confidence, and it definitely transforms lives and improves quality of life of the patient. And sometimes we need to say no. Next. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So, uh, how does the combination, how does the combination of art and science of natural hair transplant technique contribute to achieving more aesthetically pleasing and natural looking result for patient compared to traditional method? See, uh, artistry and science are two aspects of uh, Basically, we call them principles of uh, hair transplant. Artistry is involved in designing the hairline. So the operating surgeon should has got a sh need to have a good aesthetic sense while designing the hairline. After designing the while designing the hairline, he has to keep in mind the forehead width, the age of the patient, the area of baldness. Then, uh, then in artistry as well, they need to kind of uh, keep in mind how many grafts are to be transplanted in which area the distribution the proper direction of the hair follicle and then when we talk about signs hair follicle actually hair follicles are in hair transplant hair follicles are actually harvested from donor area and these are transplanted into the recipient area science is involved because this is a surgery in which we have to remove hair follicles safely from the donor area and transplant them into the recipient area they should be viable, alive, and they should be they they they, they kind of uh, they should regrow actually. So science comes in that 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 part. And when we talk about traditional uh, methods, traditional methods were actually a kind of uh, hair transplant started long back in 1916, 1970, and at that time the techniques were quite crude, leaving a lot lots and lot of lots of scars these aspects the artistry and science were not followed and it has made a huge impact huge change uh, in the field of hair transplant and definitely it's it's a ever growing field new uh, inventions are coming and new things are coming which will further add to the quality of hair transplant results and it will keep growing thank you thank you very much sir uh, for your presentation and for a nice reply now i'll request for the for the last presentation. So I will request Dr. Inderchand Indra Singhvi, sir. Sir is general surgeon, endo and laparoscopist. Sir is uh, currently working in uh, Navodaya Medical College, Raichur. He is professor in surgery. He has got many rewards and recognition. Dr. Singhvi was also conferred with the Limca Book of Record in 2003. So give a big round of applause for Dr. Indachin Singh Visa. I was not knowing this is the session especially meant for the eternal hospital. So repeatedly I am asking uh, Makar sir, so give a chance to present some of the cases. So with uh, knowingly and unknowingly he has given a chance to me 
to present some of the cases. So, some of the interesting cases which I am practicing surgery from the last 28 years. So, I had a bunch of interesting cases in all branches, urology, plastic surgery, pediatric surgery and so many things. So, I am going to present some of the interesting cases. You know that our gurus, Dr. Narsangi, Dr. E.J. Shushrata, these are my teachers. I learned endoscopic from the Navada, so back. Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad. These are my guru. I am giving Sadhyanjali to them. Dr. Raghavendra Kulkarni is an advisor to the um, health minister now. So, my talk is regarding the role of general surgeon in the present scenario. See, the uh, surgeon, the role of surgeon, particularly general surgeon, is at present is having no value, provided he has to go practice either in the district place or in a taluka place. Because in the, so many branches has been emerged from the general surgeon, like urosurgery, gastrosurgery, plastic surgery, oncosurgery, neurosurgery, pediatric surgery, and cardiovascular surgery. So uh, some of the cases which, as a general surgeon, which I did, I want to uh, present in front of you. Eurosurgery, so vesicle calculus. You may ask, what is this vesicle calculus? Anybody can operate. Any surgeon can operate. No? So this is a vesicle calculus. This old man having Alzheimer's disease, neglected in the house, having very painful misuration, landed with retention. So I put the catheter investigated, found vesicle calculus. I thought I will remove this vesicle calculus because there are no urologists in my town. So I did suprapubic systolithotomy. I opened the bladder. It was a very big stone. I removed it and after kept the catheter for five days. Then after five days, I asked the patient to go home with catheter because I was knowing it is a big catheter, big calculi, so it may start leaking. So with the catheter, I sent. Seventh day, they phoned me. Sir, there is a high-colored urine is coming. He is bleeding. Then we asked the patient to come back. And after coming back, uh, we had thought that it may be some infection. We get, according to culture and sensitivity, we were treated. The bleeding has not stopped. Then we did the, call the urologist and did the cysto, uh, cystoscopic examination. There was a small ulceration, which we took the biopsy. It was found to be a carcinoma. So the take-off message here is any chronic irritation, any chronic irritation in the body may lead to carcinoma. That is the take-off message. Next. Foreign body per urethra. You know, what is that foreign body, sir, urology, sir? Urology is there? Sir, foreign body, you know, the, the such cases are very rare, you will see. What he did, this fellow is a young, because of the sexual gratification, he has putting the, our charger inside the charger. You see, you can see the charge, charger wire. He has cut both the end of the charger. He has get introduced into the urethra. And you, after taking the x-ray, it was found that it was curling. We tried to remove it by cystoscopically, by putting the jalak and try to remove it, it start bleeding. So we did once again the cystolithotomy and remove the, this one. And this was been uh, presented as a international journey of biomedical and advanced research. Mobile charges cable in the bladder was presented in the Indian Journal of the Surgery. So, neglected catheter. You know, in village, people are very funny. Those people who are not working, they will neglect. So, this is a man of 70 years. Came in the night with retention of urine. 
So I put the catheter. Then morning he disappeared. Without notice he gone. Then after one year he came. So the whole the vessel calculus and the bowel, the, okay, um, the in front of the catheter, the, there will be a calcification. So they, it cannot be coming. There in the town they tried it and it is not coming down. Then I landed here. We did the cystoscope. We did the. Um, we took the X-ray as well as ultrasound, and uh, we found out there is a vesical calculus. So once again, we did the supra supra tatami and removed the catheter. Stunt engulfed the vesical calculus. Similar to the STC previous cases, here the urology always they will put the stunt, and there will be a vesical calculus. That vesical calculus start pulling the J wire and it is peeping from the penis. So we removed once again with the cystoscopic by removed by the cystolithotomy. So some of the gastro surgery also I had. So the, the main aim of presentation here is so I had some unusual cases which I am going to present. So gastro, gastro, I mean gastric surgery I got a gastric outlet obstruction very rarely we will see such cases. Superior mesenteric artery syndrome. 37 old adult male patient came to the casualty with an informant mother, complained of pain abdomen since six months and persisted vomiting since one month. The patient was admitted in the same of a complaint, different hospital for the same. And after investigation, next, after investigation with ultrasound as well as CT, it was showing as a superior mesenteric artery syndrome. So the second part of the duodenum will be compressed by the both vertebra as well as this one. So after doing this, we did the surgery. Karen, so the patient after doing the surgery is fine. The, the surgery is posterior vertical retrocolic isoperistatic dulob gastrogenostomy we done. So TB enterocutaneous fistula. This patient, you have seen the tuberculosis is very common in the small intestine. No? So here I am seeing one of the patient with having enterocutaneous fistula, with, uh, with having suffering from the tuberculosis, chest x-ray. She is having tuberculosis. Next, we did the, we the, put the, in that fistula we put the um, you know, feeding tube and at that time there was not, not much uh, facilities are there. So barium push and saw that there was a stricture in the end that will be having a connection with the uh, back of the uh, abdomen. So we removed it. So another important case is the trichobazar. See dilated stomach. Here I will tell a little story. <coughs> Young girl of about 18 years, his mother died then immediately um, uh, father is married to another and there is a clash between the new mother and this girl and whenever they had some fight she is going to the room and snatch the hair and is to eat. So she landed with the omitting so I got endoscope so I put the endoscope and found that there is a trichobazar. Fast, fast. Go fast. Okay, and so this is a trichobazar which I had. It. Next. So some of the interesting case in the, so so many ver uh, various parasites also been removed. So excise uh, tapeworm during appendicectomy, the patient is present as appendicectomy. At the base of the appendix, some yellow color was there. So I start pulling that yellow color, it was found to be a tapeworm. And hydratis is very common. Any general, see so many round worms, thousand together round worms came with the intestinal obstruction and 
for the same patient after some time if they came with the upper abdomen pain and I through I put the endoscope and there was a round worm in the second part of the tiruna so to the endoscopically I removed this worm the foreign body is removed so many foreign bodies like uh, removed from the uh, needle uh, glass piece then carcinoma also then varicelles and metal pieces has been removed through the endoscope laparoscope laparoscope in this day everybody is doing laparoscope laparoscope appendectomy diagnostic laparoscopy then laparoscopic cholecystectomy so many stone has been removed Oh, so well, one other important thing is when there is an impaction of the stone in the common bile duct presenting as a <coughs> jaundice, so I removed so many stent present behind yeah, primary closer. So uh, up till now, people are very much fear to, uh, to, uh, to suture primarily. So I always used to do open um, uh, colidocolitostomy and remove the sands. So another important thing, gauge piece, ah, they are retained in the breast. So patient probably asking in detail story, the patient is a pregnant and she had a breast abscess, the breast abscess was drained and after that they came with the, some mass in the left breast and after opening I found that there are a lot of gas, uh, gas pieces are there. Then some of the anco surgery which I performed by partial gastrectomy I done after confirming with the um, endoscopic biopsy, partial gastrectomy, squamous cell carcinoma of the right arm wide excision and clearance of the axilla, carcinoma of penny with the prepuce and secondary and inguinal reasons, partial amputation done and inguinal block has been done. So in the village there are funny people, once they say feel that the, the surgery is done, everything is done. So we ask the patient to go for the radiotherapy, they didn't go on, after six months to one year they came to the hospital in the midnight with the erosion of the femoral artery and died. In front of me, he died. The squamous cell of the carcinoma of the scrotal wall. Show some of the picture. Go fast. Some of the plastic surgery I did. Burn scar contracture repair. Very difficult intubation. Neurosurgery. Another most important, any neurosurgeon is there. No, nobody, everybody has gone. So, there is a shanoma which is present over the head. So, we removed that shanoma and the patient is doing fine. The pediatric surgery, some of the pediatric surgery also we did. Ectopic vesicular extrastrophy of the bladder. You can see that extrastrophic bladder with two pennies. A man having two pennies with bifold scrotum. So we have put the, with the interesting thing, I put the both the pennies, whether it is having two bladder or what, I put the feeding tube and took the x-ray by putting the barium. So two testes in the left scrotum, right scrotum is empty. Right scrotum is empty, left side having two testes. So the patient was not uh, um, ready for the archidectomy. Then another test is I push on the left side on the right side female reproductive structures are present in the hernial sac in a male child so you can see that so there is a testis there is a gallbladder hey you, you can see that there is a testis you can see the uterus fallopian tubes and other all those things the architectomy has been done for this patient congenital umbilical hernia or omphalocele a day baby came with the swelling in the umbilical region. So this way, uh, once again I operated this case, he is having hernia, the hernia sac been repaired, and they pushed all the small intestine in contaminated, and 
push it inside the abdomen first teratoma from oral cavity this is only a unique case so this case i got limca book of record so this a day baby one day baby is having teratoma you have seen the teratoma is present in the sacrococcal region you have seen the teratoma present in the testes you have seen the teratoma present in the ovary here it has presented a case in the oral cavity it is very rare it is 0.1 in 10000 birth it seems so i removed it so you can see the hairs you can see in the bone so 3 year after the surgery the child is like that and she has got cleft palate we are repaired with the facial imaging surgery today lakshmi is 28 leading a healthy life so award and recognition this i got limca book of record in 2003 a poster presentation in our karnataka surgeon association and this was a certificate which has been rendered to me oral teratoma has been presented as a case report and i've been honored as a surgeon in the our karnataka i've been felicitated by the andhra chief minister vyas rajshekar reddy so this is the things thank you great sir thank you very much for such a nice presentation so give a big round of applause for sir again thank you i before only i thanks makkar i was not knowing it is exclusively for the eternal hospital i think no no then uh, uh, i made you to force to that uh, and to present such cases i think people are not there but really it is interesting madam how you feel it is interesting no na no, see thank you very much makkar sir thank you so much sir it was not exclusively but it was easy for me to manage things uh, so my theme was to one person from eternal in each category and one person from outside so we are pleased to have you here sir thank you so much thank you. so uh, that concludes our uh, surgical symposium of today and uh, thank you nitesh for sparing the whole evening and conducting this so well thank you all of you who have lasted till last thank you so much thank you